All right, welcome to my YouTube channel or to the show if you're listening to this on podcast. This is Jeff Lerner, so glad that you're here. Um, and I have a really exciting guest today as part of our Millionaire Secrets interview series. Um, it's a little bit of a, of a twist, kind of a curveball guest, and I'm really excited about it. Her name is Fiora Mensch, and she's going to hopefully congratulate me for pronouncing that right um, and not, not uh, chastise me for mucking it up. But um, she is actually somebody that I met when I was speaking at a conference in, I can't remember where, but she's going to fill that in for me and remind me. San Diego. But, uh, San Diego was, yeah, that's right. It was San Diego. And it was the, the JVology event, right? Mm-hmm. So anyway, Fiora is here and I, I'm really excited about this conversation because uh, I feel like we get to have two in one and, and I'm going to let Fiora, you know, in, introduce herself more than trying to, to, to butcher it. But I will say this, there are two conversations that I think we can have here. One is the usual conversation that we always have on my channel with other successful new economy entrepreneurs, people that have blazed the trail and shown that nowadays you don't have to while away all your time commuting to and from a job. And basically there's just massive ocean of opportunity if you learn the skills and learn how to take advantage of it. Theora is a great example of that. But also what she does, which I'm going to let her talk about, is, is a subject that is super interesting to me in the realm of communication and relationships. Um, and so I think that we get to have two really awesome conversations in one here, and I am super excited to welcome Fiora to the show. Fiora, welcome, I'm glad you're here. Thanks for having me. I'm very excited to see what we uncover today. Yes. No, I'm uh, so glad you're here. And again, I'm, I've, I've lightly stalked you online. Um, probably not as much as you've been stalked by others online. <laughs> I'm sure there's stories there that maybe you don't want to tell, but um, I have lightly stalked you online and I have been very interested. I have read many of your posts about relationships and communication and, you know, I'm married. Not for the first time, by the way. I've done it well and I've done it poorly. So, like, I, I'm fascinated by the subject. Um, but also, you seem to have a really kick-ass business. And I think that there's this, you know, world out there, and even I wrestle with this, of like people, you know, turning their passion or their interest into a business as opposed to taking a more maybe practical approach and saying, nobody cares what your passion is. Just pick a business model that's established and proven and turn that into a business, right? You seem to be someone... And, I'm, and I'm, I'm inferring this because of the depth and the sort of the passion that's infused in the way you do your business and what you say, uh, you know, publicly anyways, that this really is your passion. Like what you're mm-hmm. doing is truly what you love doing and that you've built a really thriving business, I think, in, in a highly enviable way to most people. Like you have built a really thriving business doing exactly what you love to do. So if I'm right about that, props for doing so. And I would love if you could share that journey because I think it's like, it's the ultimate aspiration of so many people. Yeah. Yeah, totally. And it's definitely something that as a kid, when they're like, what do you want to be when you grow up? You're not like, ooh, a dating and relationship consultant. <laughs> <laughs> that, wasn't, you know? that wasn't even on the list, right? Yeah, right. Exactly. Yeah. And it was absolutely, it was something that um, orig- I originally got into just through like my own uncanny curiosity and was like in self-discovery and self-exploration for years before stepping into, which I'm sure a lot of your listeners are here because they have something that they, it's like the thing they can't not do. Mm -hmm. Um, And then there's this curiosity of like, God, like I'm so compelled in this direction. What might it be like to create an infrastructure where that could actually like generate financial abundance for me and freedom and all that stuff. So um, I definitely didn't get into the study of relationship and communication and the energetics of intimacy and all that stuff. Um, thinking that it would ever turn into anything, right? Like I was working my nine to five at the time. Um, But like you said, in the new economy, there's really, like you can create a business really around anything, Um, uh, especially if there's like that compulsion there for you. So yeah, I mean, I I just, I was like very pulled to it, Um, really wanted to understand it for myself and then also got to, wanted to understand how, well, began to start helping people around me understand, like, how do you have robust relationships? Um, if, we, if we can create wealth and we can create health and we can create success with, with enough, like, 
uh, information and education and intent, like why, why wouldn't relationships also follow that same natural law? Hmm. Right. So, so it's, I I didn't, I just didn't really believe that it was like, yeah, in all of these areas, if you, if you dive in, you can create what you truly desire. But here, sorry guys, that's Russian roulette forever. I was like, "Mm, I don't, that doesn't, that doesn't really make sense. So um, I really started to come at it with like more of like a scientific analytical approach of like, what are, who are the people that are studying this? Who are the experts? And like, how are they creating like methodologies and ways of understanding, relating communication, intimacy, sexuality? Um, And, and then like started to really like bring those together to create an understanding of like what makes a relationship dynamic, what creates longevity, what creates fulfillment. Um, so yeah, I'm kind of like, if you want to get healthy and fit, you hire a personal trainer. If you want really amazing relationship, you hire me. Yeah, that's, it's so true. You know, you mentioned kind of the three classical niches, right? At least for marketers, we say everything ultimately, if you want to sell something, you have to fit it into health, wealth, or relationships, right? Yeah. Um, health, obviously the body is a system. Mm-hmm. And it's very, you know, it, people take a very scientific approach to the body. Wealth, you know, money and business are very systematic and people take a scientific approach to that. But you're right, relationships, everybody seems to be like, well, I don't know, it's love, love works in mysterious ways. And that, yeah, that's yeah. like, that's the, they write it off almost. It's something that they, they, they can't ultimately get control over. And what you're saying is actually you can't. Yes. Yeah. And I think like, it's really interesting because there's a there, it, there's like an art and a science to it, right? So like even the word control, because I'll tell people like there's right. a methodology. Like you can really engineer incredible relationships, and then they'll come back to me and say, "Well, wait, is everything tactical here? What about the magic and the falling in love?" And one of the metaphors I like to use is like, so when you create a really powerful marketing strategy, right, in your business, you're not like, "Oh man, like leads just keep rolling in, bummer." Yeah, is, right, right. Right? You're like, oh my God, this is working. This is amazing. And like, you're, you're that is, watching. That is the magic, right? Exactly, right? And so right now you have people just walking around thinking they have no influence over their marketing strategy versus mm-hmm. if it's like, no, there's actually ways that you can show up that will drastically increase you. So if they're single, right? Like drastically increase your ability to connect with people, your ability to connect with people that are higher quality matches for you. Um your ability to, um, and if you're in partnership as well, like drastically increase your ability to connect, to overcome those like crunchy bits, those places where you have common communication breakdowns, right? Like, so like there's these strategies that actually, like you said, like that they create the magic. Um, recently I was, I was talking on a podcast. It's like, it's like that moment. Do you, do you ever read Harry Potter? You have kids, right? Yeah, I've, I've seen the movies. I haven't read okay. Them. Well, there's that moment when Hagrid's like, you're a wizard, Harry, you know? And like before, like there would, there would be these magic things that would happen around Harry. And he was like, ah, like, I don't know, like what's going on? And then like someone hands him a wand. It's not like, oh man, magic is real. It's like, no, but like now you have to cast the spells. Right. right. So, or you get to cast the spells is maybe a better way. So yeah, so there is like a lot of engineering that can go into creating really amazing relationships and like what's better than a high quality relationship you know that's so interesting because you're right like like with health nobody's like oh well you know i'm what about just letting the magic happen it's like no lift weights eat better food do cardio stretch you know and then and then with finance nobody's like well i just want to stumble into money it's like no you need to think about it you need to plan for it you need to engineer it and then relationships it's like we've all been listening to way too many country songs yeah where like there's not supposed to be any any yeah and i get why you don't like the word control because yeah. that, that overbearing it's like you're controlling another person yeah um but but it, engineering is probably a great word for it so okay i want to put a pin in that because yeah. this is amazing and my instinct is uh, this is all i want to talk about because i'm married my wife my kid like my that that's such a huge part of my life and frankly i've been through really crappy versions of it and I've been through a lot of therapy for it and like I geek out like John Gottman's like one of my favorite writers mm. you yeah. know and I don't know a lot of internet marketers would be like John Gottman's one of my five favorite writers but I just that's like my world but but I want to make sure that we serve people mm. who are like well that's great that's all cool 
how the hell did you make a business out of that? How did you make a livelihood out of that? Because that's, that's where so many people I think are stuck. Um, so do you mind taking us back? Yeah, totally. Can you add, like, do you want me to talk about the mechanics of doing it or like the, the moment of taking the leap or? Yeah, I probably, I would say yes to both of those. Okay. Um, but in general, I think specifically speaking to the person who's not sure they can do it or not sure that it, it's even doable. Yeah. Because I, I take myself back and if somebody said, you know, Jeff, you're going to, you know, when I was 28 years old, I was a broke out of work jazz musician. And somebody said, listen, Jeff, you're going to, you know, you're going to get started with affiliate marketing. You're going to sell $15 million worth of affiliate products. You're going to start your own agency. You're going to build it to the ink. Fire. I mean, this sounds like I'm just rattling off my, you know, whatever. But if somebody yeah. said, you're going to do all these things, I would have been like, How? there's no way I can do all that. That doesn't sound realistic to me. Um, and I think a lot of people, but for some reason still, and it was for me, it was a function of a lot of desperation. I was like, well, I don't have anything to lose. I don't have anything else going. So I need to still take this leap because otherwise I'm literally feel like I'm going to die because I'm so mm -hmm. stuck. Mm -hmm. But yeah. to a lot of other people, they have just, you know, I say good is the enemy of great because a lot of people have just enough going in their life yeah. that it keeps them hypnotized and they don't take the leap because they don't really think it sounds realistic. Yeah. So I like to, I would, I, what I'm looking for from you is to go back to that moment, the moment or the process of like how it became real for you. How did you, how, maybe what happened for you that made you that exception that would take the leap, but also mm -hmm. how did the leap look? Because the goal here is to inspire other people to do it too. Yeah. Yeah. So um, I had spent three years, not like corporate, I was working in a small business and I, I, I was like, I had done, I had done the academic track. I was going to be a great employee. I was going to, I, I could have seen myself working for them for 15 years. Huh. Um, and then a couple things unfolded uh, in that experience. And I was like, Ooh, they really don't have my back here. Right. Like I was like ride or die for this company. Um, and then it was really apparent that like, I was just a cog in the machine. So I actually left my place of work without a backup plan. And I was lift driving. I was doing, <laughs> I, wow. was do I was doing cider samples at Oktoberfest. <laughs> uh, I was nannying my friend's kit. Like I was just, cause I, I, and I, cause I also had, when I left, um, I internalized what was, what now I can see with retrospect was like really a lack of integrity on their part. But I internalized it. I was like, oh, I must not, I must not be good at anything. Right. Um, and so this was, this is when I was 27, 28. Um, and yeah, so I spent about the, the next six months just floundering about, and I had this narrative going on, like, man, I'm a, I have a college degree. I'm, I'm an intelligent person. I'm a hard worker. Like what's wrong with me? Why? Like, I guess I'll just serve tables like I did in college, mm -hmm. you know? Um, and that through that period of time, I was working with the life coach and, um, and I remember going, um, to a retreat paid on a credit card that I didn't know how to pay off. And, um, everyone there was a life coach. And I remember thinking, oh man, like, I guess you can have a career helping people like be happy and make money. And so it kind of like, oh, I was like, maybe I'm going to try that. Um, and so I, I just gave myself permission to try and I reached out to somebody and said like, Hey, uh, I want to give this a shot. I don't know if I'm going to be any good at it, but I'm wondering if you would be a developed client, developmental client with me. And they said, yeah. Um, and so that was technically my first client. Um, so did, I think did you charge them money. No, we did a work trade. Okay, cool. We did a work trade, but, um, but for me, <clears throat> It, it was like the perfect first step because it gave me the six month window to watch the results I was able to create with her and then walk away being like, Oh, I can help people. I think sometimes like one of the most beautiful gifts you can give yourself is experience. Um, so that like, you're not trying to out believe your, or you're not trying to, I think you've, I heard you say like outpace your own belief system, right? Yeah. Like if you don't believe you can do it. Right. So it's like, well, fuck it. Get, can I swear? No, it's, it's fucking <laughs> me. <laughs> you know, uh, it's like, it's like give yourself three clients, create results with them, regardless whether it's like teaching singing lessons or, you know, what have you. And then when you, when you go to bat with that fourth client, 
like you have, you, you have your own results to back you up. Right. Um, and you're not, it makes it a lot easier to sell your services too. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Um, so I, that's where I started was just like the life coaching thing. Mm -hmm. Um, so I have a lot of love for life coaches because like who doesn't want a great life? Um, and then honestly, like I, I floundered about like the, I was, I was by far, I had been in the, like studying intimacy and relationship. I bought my first book on relationship when I was 16. So I didn't like that. Like, you know, how Steve Jobs says you can like connect the dots backwards. Right. Um, so now I'm, I'm thinking, oh, wow, this was a, this was a through line forever. And I just didn't, it didn't like distill into, um, form, uh, in a really conscious way until later. But I meandered from one, I was like, maybe I can help people with this. Maybe I can help people with this. Maybe. I, so I was making money, but I, and this is one of the things when people really start to work for themselves and they're like, what's my niche? What's my niche? What I'm, I'm like, like, just try shit. Mm -hmm. Try shit and you'll be like, ooh, actually, like that doesn't super excite me to work with those people, you know? And so um, I got into it where I started actually helping business partners with their relationships. And I loved that, but I was way more lit up by the work that would, that would end up under the same um, like contract time period would be them like going back and having improved relationships with their partners, right? So in, very, in a lot of ways, I really like fall. And then looking back, I'm like, oh, yeah, duh. Right. That was the, that was the area that I was always the most excited to help people where like, it was way cooler to me to help um, a couple learn how to have conversations about money than like to help people make money, you know, huh. like that's cool. But like the fact that like you and your partner can now have conversations about money and you're moving forward and then you get engaged and now you, then you get married and then you buy a house together and you're both super excited about it versus it being a point of total breakdown and isolation within the partnership. Like that was, that, you know, made me feel over the moon. So I really, I really experimented a lot coming from a space of feeling lost. Um, and then, you know, fi finally was able to like really like land and ground. And this is what I'm really, really great at. This is what I love doing. Um, and there's a massive need for it. Yeah. Yeah, really. I, uh, so I'm like taking so much from what you're saying. I've, mentally and, and I'm trying to just super focus so I'm not even taking notes but mentally I think I've I've pegged three things that I want to come back to in what you just said first of all you started with sort of a what we consider a minimum viable product it's like look I'm not going to charge you I'm working the kinks out here I just want to I just want to serve you let's do this right uh, you didn't build a website you didn't even have a brochure you didn't go set up a merchant account you didn't you know, whatever, lease an office and hire an assistant. Like people get so caught up in the setup. Yeah. You just said, I'm going to go do a thing, right? And see where it goes. So I love that. That's a big takeaway for me from what you said. Um, the second thing is, actually, I think I've got four things from what you said. So the second thing is that this through line, like you talked about connecting the dots and that for you, it was always relationships, communication, you know, connection, intimacy, that, that cluster, right? Um, I look at my own life and you just sort of illuminated, I think, a truth for me too, which is if I look at my entrepreneurial journey and I go back and say, what was I always naturally the best at and most excited about? It was trying to inspire people to, to build up both the courage and the skill set to transform their lives. Mm. Like I was in an MLM once. And I, I, I didn't really love the business model and I wasn't particularly passionate about the product, but I didn't care because it was just a vehicle. Yeah. And I was like, and I got all excited. And in like a few months I recruited, no, I think in my first month I recruited like 20 people. And, and it was like, it was all just, it was just ignorance on fire. It was enthusiasm, you know? And I look back and then it's like, oh, I did affiliate marketing and yeah, I was good at it, but I got bored because I was always at home and I was never talking to anybody and I had no relationships. And I started an agency and that was cool, but I got burned out because I was going to an office and it felt kind of sterile. And then now I have an education company where basically I get to just inspire people for a living. It's like, well, no shit. That's what you probably should have been doing all along, right? Yeah. But, but it's hindsight's 2020, right? You got to mm -hmm. go through all this stuff. And I like that you said, look for the commonalities, mm -hmm. find the stitching. Yeah. Um, it, Cause that's, that's your sweet spot. And then you have to do what you've done, which is you do have to convert that into an economically viable business. Maybe not at first when you're, you're MVPing it, but like at a certain point you have to go, okay, 
Can I charge for this? Is there a sustainable business model here? Can I support myself at my desired standard of living? You don't want to be a martyr your whole life where you chose to do work that you feel undervalued by. So, so talk to me if you would about how you kind of took that next step to say, okay, I'm going to, I'm going to, this is my thing and I'm going to establish it as a thing that can give me the life that I want to. I'm not just helping other people, but they're helping me too. Yeah. Yeah. So I want to say one little thing and then I'll answer that question. What is, I think oftentimes the thing that we're the most natural at, we, we think we don't realize that's part of our genius because it's not hard. Right. And we're so conditioned to the psychology of hard work. Right. And so for me, it was like, that was the thing I was the most, it was the easiest. It was the most natural for me. Um, And so and so I didn't give myself permission to like, it's like, oh, well then it must be that easy for everybody else. Yeah. So you must not be grinding hard enough if it comes. Yeah. Quickly, right. So let me, let me, let me like pick niches that are really hard right. <laughs> before doing the thing that's like, oh, no. So anyway, um, like yeah. what you, same thing for you, right. Where it's like, let me, let me do all these other things. And then I also think there can be a tenderness too, because the reason we're so good at it is there's probably a lot of reasons like, you know, mine was, um, you know, uh, I lost my mom when I was really young. Um, after that, my dad and I had a pretty strained relationship. And so like the reason I got so good at it is because I was really conditioned through trauma to like be a study, to try to figure it out, like how to do it well, how to get that connectivity. Um, and I think I remember you telling a story of like being the class clown, right? Yeah. I had some challenges growing up for sure. And yeah, being entertaining and developing what really was sort of a character. Yeah. Character-based personality. It wasn't really me. Who I was felt small and scared and beat up and, and shy, but it was like, if I want to have a life, yeah, I have to be able to, I have to pretend to be an extrovert basically. Yeah. And, I, and yeah. I've essentially been riding that wave ever since in anything I've done that I've done well. Yeah, exactly. And, and so there's also a tenderness to be like, okay, like I am, I am going to bet on that actually. Right. Yeah. So, Anyway, um, so how did I take the leap? So I started, I started working with clients and, um, and it was very slow to begin because um, I don't think people really understand that employee track is incredibly linear. The entrepreneurial track is incredibly nonlinear. Mm. And so it's a, it's a total, um, it's a total up level in like, the complexity of the way people get to learn how to think which is really, really cool. It makes us much more dynamic. Um, but it's uh, the, the way that we employee doesn't necessarily immediately translate to the way that we entrepreneur. Um, and so the way that you, or the way that I did, or I'll just say what I did, is like hire somebody to teach you how to think differently. Um, and, and so that was my track is I stumbled into a really amazing business coach Um, and hired them and they began to help me really like flesh out that multidimensional intelligence that goes with entrepreneurship, right? Um, Because it's not, again, it's like, it's not one-to-one, it's like one to 11, Um, which I hope people aren't hearing this and like getting daunted because like that 11 actually like creates the freedom and the fulfillment and the constant spiritual growth and I actually hope they are getting daunted because okay. I, think that there, I think that there's a toxic uh, epidemic of bullshit on the internet that is afraid to tell mm. it like it is. Mm. And, and I actually kind of pride myself on being the anti cool. that. Like I'll tell people like it's, it's hard. It's, mm-hmm. it's hard as shit. It's, it's hard to go. Cause when you, when you don't go from one to two and two to three, and th- like the linear track, like you're talking about when you stay at one for a long time, if you don't discipline yourself, like you said, and learn to think differently, your one starts to feel like a zero mm-hmm. and you'll just hover and you'll, you'll be like, this isn't working. And, and you'll be, you know, the opening, the opening story of thinking grow rich is about the guy that, that dug and dug and dug and dug for hundreds of miles. And he st- finally stopped. He gave up and he was like two feet from the, the gold. Mm. I forget something O'Leary or whatever the guy's name was like, that's how it is. And so if you don't recognize that, that, that you are building to 11 and that it'll be worth it. And, and that's what I tell people all the time is like, I'm not saying it's going to be easy. I'm saying it'll be worth it because mm. think about what you're asking. You're asking 
to be able to do something you love, do something that's fun, do something that pays you more than most employees, do something that gives you freedom, flexibility, time with your family, freedom of location, ability to travel. You're you're asking for like basically to win the lottery, but you don't want to have to be one in a million. Yeah. You think everybody gets to win the lottery? No. And, and we're not talking about a lottery where it's up to something else. It's up to you. Yeah. So you should go ahead and start. You should make the decision now that say, I'm, I'm willing to be one in a thousand because I'm trying to achieve a one in a thousand result. Yeah. And, and on that note, um, this is probably a great plug for your business. <laughs> oh, well, thank but you. I'm about to say, what, what is, what I'd love to caution people against and exactly what you're saying is like the mythology of the lone wolf. I mm-hmm. think it's one of the most toxic things in the entrepreneurial world where like even like rags to riches stories, people talk about it and they don't talk about the mentors they hired and they don't talk about the masterminds they joined or like the, the, the groups of um, other striving entrepreneurs that they like banded together with to, to, right? Like, right. Um, and so uh, is like, get support like on whatever you have to do entrepreneurship without support is hell it's it just is for real for real right and so (laughs) and it's like surround yourself with other people who are driven at the same like degree or even better more than you that will like stretch you forward that will pull you forward Mm -hmm. um hire people people that are smarter than you surround yourself with people that Um, get the complexity and the dynamism of entrepreneurship. Um, Yeah. Like whenever people say, what's the first step? I'm like, hire a teacher. (laughs) I just get like you, like take their 15 years of experience um, and leverage it as your own versus trying to don't try to figure it all out yourself. It's going to take you 15 years, hire someone who's been doing it for 15 years and it'll take you one. Right. Yeah, it, Collapse it, time. It, and it, and it, it the same. So, yeah, I mean, I totally agree with you. And I always say before you can be an entrepreneur, you have to learn to be entrepreneurial. Yeah. Because I think that entrepreneurialism is a precursor to entrepreneurship. Like you said, you have to think a certain way before you'll successfully do a certain thing. Right. Yeah. Um, but realize that it, it, it is it's, it's all about delayed gratification. It is going to be worth it. Mm-hmm. It, it's, but it, it has to be hard. Mm-hmm. Right. So anyway, so, so for you, I want to, I want to get back to your story. Um, so you start providing services and you know, you and I have talked a little bit. I mean, now your ideal client, like you're, you know, you work with like high performance CEOs, executives, people that frankly have the resources to invest a lot mm-hmm. in mastering that part of their relation or that part mm-hmm. of their life. And frankly, who probably don't have all the time in the world to spend on it. They might be seeing their partner an hour a day and they need that hour to be excellent. Yeah. Um, so how did you get to that level where, I mean, you know, I, I got to imagine there's a lot, first of all, I know there's a lot of life coaches out there and I got to imagine that within that, there's a lot of relationship coaches out there, but you've like, you've actually, and you hear a lot of stories. I mean, I hate to say it, but life coach is kind of synonymous. It's like, oh, I dropped out of school and became a life coach. Like, it's almost yeah. like a non-thing, sadly. Yeah. Um, yeah. But you actually have done it at the level, not, not just that, but relationships. It's not only a thing, it's like an awesome thing. Like, you have, you have influence, you have an audience, you have high-paying, high-performance clients that probably actually implement what you teach them and use it to get great results. So, you're super fulfilled. Like, how did you make that leap to let's call it the one percent? Yeah, I definitely didn't start out there, right? When I first started co- coaching, I think my first paid client was like one hundred and fifty dollars a month, um, and uh, definitely made a again like a big leap when I started working with my business mentor because um, they expanded the way that I that I thought um, and like organically, you know. I, I mean, I hate. I wish that there was like this like trick or something, but it was um, as I kept sophisticating what I was teaching and the way I was teaching it and pulling in like a higher complexity of, um, or maybe like more sophisticated, right? Is like the people it spoke to, because I'm combining practical strategy, which speaks very directly to the entrepreneur or the executive, right? Like oftentimes like, just tell me what to do and I'll do it, you know? 
um, as well as the energetics. Um, so like my, I have some background in like tantric teachings and then as well as like the evolutionary biological, like how do humans bond? How do our nervous system, nervous systems impact our ability to connect or disconnect? Um, and so I think like that speaks to people that are already really cognizant of their psychology, of their nervous systems, of the fact that like energy is a thing, um, okay. that want, that want um, a designed higher intelligence strategy, right? So like in that sense, it, people really started self-selecting in. And I also gave myself permission to like speak to that audience as I'm not your, I'm not your first pe personal development rodeo. Right. Like if you're unfamiliar with quantum physics, let's like go read some books and like do a Tony right. Robbins seminar and then come to me, you know. Um, but the like I have definitely what I've done is I've really given myself permission and highly tailored my services to the optimization population. These are the people who are very cognizant of like biohacking and like optimizing their health. They, they're the kind of people who are like testing their blood to see if it's healthy, not people who are like, Hey, like men's health says eat potatoes. You know what I mean? <laughs> right. Um, so you're, you're sort of unapologetically top tier. Yeah. I love that by the way. I, I literally feel like you just through a very different context described my approach to what I do. I have had, so many people say things like your YouTube videos need to be shorter. Um, your sales letters need to be more, you, you know, you need to write to an eighth grader just, you know, across the board. I've, I've sort of unapologetically said like, I'm going to be me mm -hmm. and I've spent 25 years optimizing myself. I mean, I was, I was buying Tony Robbins products off of infomercials literally with my parents' credit card when I was a teenager. Like that's just how I am. I want to be better. I want to be smarter. I want to be faster. I want to be stronger. I want, and, and even when I was a broke musician, I was still committed to excellence. And so now don't ask me to go to market and apologize for that or start dumbing everything down. I want to attract, you know, like attracts like, yeah. and, 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 and real attracts real. If you ask me to be, don't ask me to be strategically fake. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. You know, I'd rather be non-strategically real and then layer strategy on top of that. And it's worked. It's worked. There's people who are like, you know, my, not to like go down a rabbit hole in my industry, but pe there's people who said, Jeff, you'll never be able to launch an online business education company without having a really big pre-existing brand like a Gary Vee or a Tony Robbins or a Russell Brunson or, you know, a Ty Lopez or something. You could never launch a company like Entra and sell high ticket coaching and mastermind products without either a really strong brand or like some kind of an MLM comp plan where people are like buying it so that they can qualify to sell it or make money somehow, right? Mm -hmm. And I, I, I literally think to myself, if I had taken anybody's advice, then they all would have been right. Mm -hmm. But it's because I've done it this way that there's people who are like, they're already making six figures. They're, they're not the kind of people that are like, oh, I need to go figure out how to make a hundred dollars a day on the internet. But they're, they're listening to me about what's possible in the new economy because I don't speak, you know, to, a, to, to the lowest common denominator. I just want, yeah. and I got to think for you, it's like, you're not talking about how to hook up with 10 babes in 90 days. You're going, look, if you want to have an amazing life, with a rich relationship with your partner, like I'm, I can help you with that. Yeah. I won't pander to what 99% of people probably say they want. Yeah. I'm not going to help you pick up people in bars. Cool. Cause that's not actually what people want. Right. 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 So it's but, actually, they say, but it's what they say. A lot of people say they want, right? Yeah. I mean, like you're saying, it's like you're actually insulting their intelligence versus like there's a, I think there's a spiritual imperative. Like there's a reason why we love love. You know, like when you see a surprise and sometimes I, I just watch these on YouTube. Right. But like when you, <laughs> the compilation, right, when you right. see a surprise proposal, everybody cheers and cries and halt. like people don't even fucking know the two people. Right? right. And like, why is that? It's not, they're not just like, right. Like people like holler and jump around. You'll see people cheering and it's like, oh, there's something deep, like in our core that that touches. Yeah. Um, and that to me communicates a spiritual imperative that is widely unmet. 
Um, and so, yeah, like, I don't really care about like getting you a boyfriend or getting you a girlfriend. I care about finding you somebody who's going to be your spiritual growth partner for life. And that's what people who are like being really honest with themselves actually want. So, so, so how do you, I'm curious to the extent you're comfortable sharing, how do you convert that structurally into a business model that gives you a really high quality of life? I mean, just economically, like, do you have continuity programs? Is it all training time for money? Do you have, have you looked at, you know, mastermind events? Like what's your model and where, where is it now? And where do you see yourself taking it? Yeah. So, um, it's interesting cause I'm like in the middle of a restructuring. So I've done a variety of things, right? I had a membership for a while. Um, I've done short-term group, group programs. I've done longer term group programs. I've done one-on-one, um, cause I was doing a little bit shiny object syndrome. I, anybody who's been in your field for a little bit where it's like, do this, do that, do that. And I'm actually really glad I did all of that. Um, but then very recently really like took a step back and was like, great, like how do I actually build this into a much more sophisticated structure? Um, so like moving forward, it will look like, uh, there will be like some shorter term programs and then there will be longer term programs. And then, um, I still like we're working one-on-one. Um, so I have a handful of clients with whom I work that way. Uh, but yeah, it's, it's the, it's the leveraging the group model. So how, uh, so leveraging the group model. Yeah. I, I do encourage people you know, it's interesting. I mean, so the way we, t- let me take a step back. The way we teach becoming an entrepreneur is we say, start with these business models because most people don't know what they want to do. They don't know what their strengths are. They don't know how they would convert, even if they did, how they would convert it into a viable business model. So we're like, you know, it's a lot easier to figure that stuff out when you have momentum and traction, right? So start with affiliate marketing, start with you know, building a Shopify store. We have, we teach people to start an agency and sell services. We have have a variety of business models, but you didn't actually start that way. You Mm -hmm. literally started by saying, what am I, what do I want to do? Yeah. Right. So I'm curious now that, because there's two, there's, there's, I think there's two stages. There's figuring out how to do what you love and want to do and do it well. Mm -hmm. And then there's, learning all the marketing and sales and business mechanics and operations of like how to actually structure it as a business so that you can make a life out of it. Right. Yeah. Um, you did the first first and mm-hmm. the second second. Yeah. I did the second first and yeah. the first second. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so I'm curious if you had it to do over again, which would you recommend or, or can you even answer that question? Yeah, I think, I mean, it's, I don't, I don't know if I, yeah, I don't think I could have done it like because if I'd done it the other way, I might have learned all these like really amazing entrepreneurial skills, but um, I wouldn't have loved what I was doing. So I would have, well, or just, I mean, you even mentioned this in your story, right? Like I would have replaced a nine to five that was really hard with uh, being like a self employed job that was right, really right. hard. And that might have, and I might have drawn the wrong conclusion that therefore um, I, I actually don't want to be an entrepreneur. Right. And right, I might have right. gone back to like the most practiced, the most conditioned option, which is work for someone else. Um, so I know for me, that was the most important. Um, I think the model for like a softer service like mine, that's a great place to play is starting out with those one on one clients. Right. You know, if you have four one on one clients, that's what, four hours a week. Right. Right. And you can actually start to create that experience and like so- some kind of like income regular income, depending on how much you're charging, you know, um, and that will only sustain your interest and your life to, to such a, such a degree. Mm-hmm. Right. And then you'll start to hunger for more sophistication, you know, uh, greater wealth, um, greater co- impact. Um, right. and, and, and so that's sort of, that was my journey more so like I did the one one and then I experimented on these group ones, which I'm also glad I did because now I know what I don't like doing. And like where I don't thrive. Um, so as I'm like rebuilding and relaunching my programs, I'm really freaking clear that like the things that I'm launching are things that I'm super excited about and I can get behind very um, in integrity authentically with a lot of excitement. Right. So, uh, you know, we, we, we advocate a lot the same approach, you know, the one-on-one client services model, um, you know, we, we talk about, look, you come in, learn a modicum of digital marketing skills. And the, yeah. for a lot of people, 
the easiest path to entry to get a meaningful level of income is go find three or four businesses, you know, local businesses, get the call the, the bagel shop and the, the bar and the, you know, the, the laundromat or whatever and help them with their digital marketing. Four clients at $1,000 a month, you know, doubles a lot of people's incomes yeah. right? with work that is dramatically higher leverage than most people's jobs in terms of time and money. And you're basically saying the same thing, right? Yeah, um, exactly the same thing. So with us, we can say, look, there's 30 million small businesses in the United States. Most of them have no marketing plan. Most of them have a budget, a little bit of a budget, at least, and don't know what to spend it on. So there should, you should be surrounded by potential clients that can at least afford some meaningful engagement, at least $500 to $1,000 a month. In your space, I suspect a lot of people are like, well, you know, how am I going to go find people to pay me money to talk to them about their life or their relationships? Or there's, there's probably a little bit of a incredulity about it, right? Yeah. What's, I mean, clearly you found people to pay a lot more than that to talk about it. So, so what would you say to that person of like, are they just psyching themselves out or is there a real scarcity? Oh no, there's not a real scarcity. Um, I think, I think saying that money is easy, right? Like, it's really, it's a really great excuse to be like, oh, it's easy to sell money, right? Um, right? And like every single wildly successful person will tell you that the quality of their life is in direct proportion to the quality of their relationships. If your marriage is on the rocks and you and you're a billionaire, it doesn't fucking matter. <laughs> like, right. you know, um, or you're not talking to your kids. Like, it doesn't matter. Um, and, and so I think in the softer services is, is having the courage to have the real conversation um, and to go there with people. And yeah, like, I mean, same thing with health. If you don't have health, if, like, what do you, you don't have anything. You yeah, know if there's I mean? a market for personal trainers, there should be a market for coaches, relationship coaches, you know, service providers in the, in the relationship and, and personal development space too, right? It doesn't. Um, yeah, absolutely. Like, and I, you know, I mean, I'm, I'm having the conversation all the time of like, I just had the biggest cash month in my business ever. I did like 400,000 in sales and I was standing alone on the balcony of my luxury hotel watching a romantic sunset by myself. Mm -hmm. You know, like it was cool. You know how much cooler it would have been if their person was there with them? Right. You and know? so, yeah, and I think that people sometimes fail to realize how much, how, how much money is out there. And I mean that from two standpoints. One is money that you can go get and also money that other people already have and are willing to spend on value-based services. Yeah. You know? And... And I think people just, yeah, it's one of the reasons I like to go drive around incredible. Like I was in LA a few weeks ago and I went and I drove around Brentwood and I drove around Beverly Hills and I drove up in the Hollywood Hills. I like to look, I like to see a $50 million house because I'm like, man, I have no excuse for not figuring out how to get 1% of that, you know, at some point, like next month or something. Like it's just, yeah. the world is so big. And I think too, you know, I'm, say, I'm saying this directly to my audience. I know I'm not telling you something you don't know. Yeah, I'm yeah, saying yeah. this to my audience, like, like world, listen to me, listen to Theora. The world is so big. There is so much money out there. And I don't care if the stock market just dropped. That wasn't real money anyways, because it was, it was all digital numbers in a computer system. And now the number is small. But in terms of real wealth, there's so much out there. Well, the money it, didn't disappear. It just moved. Yeah. Well, yeah, exactly. It just reallocated. I mean, it's, it's, yeah. and, well, and the government literally, by the way, just created another trillion dollars of it I just know. in our country. I mean, it's like people get, I think people just get caught up in this, this idea that like, well, everybody can't have an amazing life. Yeah. So therefore anybody can. It's like, no, just because everybody can't doesn't mean anybody can. You can, yeah. you can. Right. And there actually is enough abundance for everybody. No, I, I know, and when I say that, it's not because of, it's not a commentary on the environment or, or the, yeah. the monetary system. I just think as human beings, I don't think we'll ever reach a place 
yeah. where there's a uniformity of belief that it's possible. Yeah. I just think there's, sadly, there's always going to be people who just don't think it's possible. And people like you and I are going to be out there doing the work to try to change that. But there will mm-hmm. always be a cause yeah. to change that, you know? Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, the way that I like to think about it is money is constantly in motion, right? It's like, where's the money going to come from? Well, wherever it is right now. Hmm. Um, and you just think about something like, I know you, like the $50 million home might, might be like maybe a little less accessible to some of your listeners, but like, just th- remember fidget spinners. Yeah. Yeah, of course. Yeah. Think about how much money was moved for f- fidget spinners. Hmm. Like millions of dollars circulated because of fidget spinners right? Like my, I guarantee that whatever service your clients, just because I know that you like lead with heart, right? Um, what, whatever your clients are trying to create, I'm sure is, is a higher value add to the planet than plastic trash that, yeah, might've been a little bit entertaining, but inevitably is going to end up in landfills and oceans and stuff, right? So whatever it is that your clients are creating, if they will take a chance on money moving for it, right? Like, yeah, it, they, it, will. it will. It will. And the answer to your question, I just Googled it, is $500 million. $500 million moved for mi- fidget spinners, which I yeah. was like, oh. Um, so, okay. So I want to, and, and I'm, sadly, we're going to run out of time. I, I want to make sure, I feel like, you know, I appreciate that you've shared, been willing to share, like, and hopefully create buy-in for people that, like, if you pursue your passion and you're willing to charge for it. And my guess is there was a point you talked about working with a coach there. Did you ever have to have a conversation where your coach was like, Diora, it's time for you to charge more for your services. Yeah. And did you have, have did you have like a a deservability self value issue about saying yes to that? Yeah. I felt uncomfortable charging $500 a month. Um, well, I, tried, I felt uncomfortable charging 150 and then I felt uncomfortable charging 500 and then I felt uncomfortable charging 1500, right? Uh, like at any, at any given point, there is an edge there. Um, and then I, I, I just have to come back to those things like fidget spinners or like what people spend on fast food, you know, like, right. which I'm, and I can, then I get to remember the quality of life that I'm introducing and standing for, for people and helping them create is priceless. Um, but yeah, absolutely. There's definitely like a, a worthiness, which is actually what makes entrepreneurship like one of the most beautiful spiritual, like growth hacks, you right. know, um, is like entrepreneurship, like you will have to face your limitations, um, and you will have to overcome them. Like it's like built into the process. Or else you physically can't make a living. Yeah. For most people, right? Yeah. If you if you start as an entrepreneur and never outgrow your your initial limitations, literally your business will never work for most people. Yeah, I, I, that's such a cool a cool point to make. So, so I, I so now that we've we've kind of hope like I said, hopefully like driven the stakes in that like you can do it right, <laughs> and I did it, and Theora did it, and everybody I've interviewed has done it, and you can do it too. Um, I I really do want to talk a little bit about. And I don't want to, so, and I don't want to cheapen it by saying like, tell me in 90 seconds or something. Like, I really want you to share if you could, um, hold on. I might be interrupting myself. I think I'm interrupting myself. <laughs> I'm interrupting myself because I actually think there's a way to kill two birds with one stone. I was going to ask you to talk a little bit about actual relationship stuff, right? Mm-hmm. Like you have this kind of a, an intro uh, of, of your approach and your methodology, but actually I think I want to pivot a little bit from that question and say, One of the key variables that I experience a lot in helping people become more entrepreneurial or become actual entrepreneurs is is relationship dynamics, right? Like, interestingly, you were talking about being able to start with your passion and grow that into a business. For me, I started by figuring out how to make money and then ultimately adapted that into being able to do my passion too as part of what I had learned, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, if I have to say it, the reason I probably started the way I did is because I was almost half a million dollars in debt when I started. So I was literally getting daily phone calls from collections and and the government and taxes and craziness. And I was like, I have to make money. And I was married at the time in a failing marriage going, if I can bring some money in, I think I, maybe that'll help heal this, right? Mm -hmm. So I had this somewhat relationship-based mandate to make money 
as a proof of concept for the whole con for entrepreneurialism as a whole. So it was like, I didn't have the, the liberty to necessarily start with what I was interested in because I was defensive from day one. Yeah. And so maybe that's a setup for you to talk about how to get started in this context. And, and this is, I know you know this too. This is not like a small, small issue. I mean, this is probably maybe, maybe the biggest inhibitor for a lot of people is spousal or partner support in starting a business. How, how do you, I'm sure you deal with that or maybe, you know, how do you talk people through that where it's like they have this vision for their life, but the, the person they're with is more concerned with safety than they are with happiness? Yeah. Um, so first and foremost, like the model you're teaching, like people don't have to abandon their nine to five to start, right? right? right. Like they can hold on to this like anchor of stability. Cause it, that's not crazy, especially like if a partner is um, economically dependent on another right. partner, um, asking them to, you know, Hey, just trust me, babe. Um, it, that's a lot. And, and it would be really beautiful and like such a like spiritually generous thing for your partner to be like, okay, you know, like, and like summon that resilience. And again, like if you're not create, if you're not, if you haven't like created a conscious partnership, it's unlikely, you know? So, um, I'm not, all, I, I think that like it's, it's a both and to start with. Right. So, um, ha you can have your corporate, uh, or what your, your, your nine to five that creates not only like financial stability, but emotional and psychological stability while starting your own business and like use that as actually a way of creating mental peace and mental clarity while you launch a company. Mm -hmm. Um, and I've, I've, I've had clients who've done that where I was like, I don't think you should quit your job right now. I think that we should, I think you should be in your job and you should spend the next six months building the, the groundwork for this business. Um, cause I, I think it is a relationally responsible thing to then be like, Hey, I've actually been, I'm, I'm working on this thing. It's, it's financially viable. I've already, I've already brought on two clients. Right. Um, and, 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 and then enrolling your partner in that is, it's going to be a wildly different conversation than I want to leave my six figure job and do this company. And like, I, I hope I can still pay for the food. And right, our right. right. So it's like giving yourself permission to like, like you don't, you don't have to burn the boats. I know Tony Robbins talks about burning the boats and you will get to a point where you, you do, you know, right. where you do leave the, the job because you'll, you'll, cause the balance will need to need to shift. And especially again, and I, I, I don't get a commission. Like I don't work for a time for anything, but I, I know the power of community, you know, and if, and as, if, as long as they're surrounded by a community like yours, that's going to call them and be, and just be like, hey, man, like it is time to, to take that leap or hey, lady, it is time to take that leap. Um, like you can trust your support will, will call you on it, right? If it's, an, if it's like an intelligent, aware community. Um, so I think that would be the first thing if someone's like thinking about quitting. Um, and yeah, does that answer your question? Yeah, it totally does. So, so let me ask uh, the follow-up question, which is, I run into this a lot too. And, and for, this is totally selfish part of the conversation because I'm really just asking you to help me do my job better. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because uh, I run into this too where people are like, they're like, man, you know, it's weird. It seems like even if I don't quit my job, even if I keep everything the same and all I'm doing is saying to my partner, like, listen, you know, listen, honey, I need 10 hours a week to build this thing, right? And I understand that's going to subtract from my availability in the home or with the kids, but I, but I really believe in it and I know I can do it. And I, I, you know, like eventually one will get to 11. So I think it'll be worth it. Can you sacrifice with me in the short term or, you know, six, 12 months, whatever it is. And the partners are just like, no, I think it's bullshit. It's a scam. You're crazy. You're an idiot. It's almost like, it's almost like when you hear about two, a couple where the two partners are really obese and then like one of them doesn't really want the other one to lose the weight kind of, which is like statistically the common scenario. Um, how do you, how do you explain that? And how do you counsel the person through that? Because I deal with it a lot where people are like, I'm not trying to quit my job. They just refuse to support what I'm trying to do. Yeah. Uh, hire a relationship coach. <laughs> 
Perfect. Perfect. I'm glad you, I'm glad like, you uh, put the setup. Yeah. I was like, let me help you. Um, <laughs> Yeah, a couple of things is oftentimes, too, the way we ask for support isn't very effective. Mm. So um, some of it is like going into it, assuming the other person's going to respond in a really clumsy manner, right? So if, like I walked into you and was like, hey, I'm going to drop this uncertainty bomb. And then my hope and expectation is the other person's going to be like, great, babe. Yeah, let's change everything. You know, that's a little crazy, right? So one of the most generous things we can do is really understand that like when we're bringing in like a, a large change or a, a variable that we want to change in a big way is like create some space and like space phys physically and time wise for someone to be clumsy about it. Hmm. Right. Um, <clears throat> another thing is when we're asking for something is uh, sharing with them what what their support would actually provide for us. So it, so is like I need your support because and these are all of all of the ways that it will empower me, um, lift me up, uh, give me the resilience to see this through, give me the resilience to show it for our family in an even deeper, bigger way. Give give me the um, like confidence and the fortitude to get us that dream house we've been talking about for the last five years, because that's something I really want to create for us. Right. Um, that's a lot different than I want to, I want to take this risk. Will you support me? Hmm. Right. So like painting a, a higher quality picture for the other person. And then the other thing is, um, is, is like really delineating like quality over quantity. So uh, I, are most of your clients men? The, the substantial majority, I would say okay. three quarters probably. So I'll speak to that a little bit, which is, um, is there are times when like you might say things um, uh, uh, like I'll use my partner, right? Like his no might not feel good to me, but it will actually make me trust him more. Right. Right. Like, I would much rather his self-assuredness um, eclipse his fear of my mood. Yeah, yeah. So I, by sense. the way, I feel like you're. I feel like you're actually coaching me in my marriage. This is tremendous. Mm. Like certainty, yeah. certainty is contagious, and if people are concerned about safety, certainty is kind of a form of safety. Yeah, and and you know, like for for my partner, right? Like we recently had a conversation, and he was sharing. Like his number one priority isn't relationship. His number one priority is his mission. I'm like a close second. You know what I mean? Right, right. Um, and that was like really uncomfortable for him to share. And like knowing what I know, I'm like, yeah, of course. Right. Um, for me, it's like relationship. And then I'm like, close second is my mission. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so we're like just slightly switched that way. But um, and we had a whole conversation about like time together is quality over quantity. I would rather have one hour of his undivided attention than three hours of his divided attention. Sure. Hands down. But so if he could give me or like, you know, for your client, like if you can sit down and say, I'm not just taking it away from you. This is actually how I'm going to show up for you differently. So while like I may not be available Saturday mornings because I'm working at noon, I'm closing my computer and you, I'm turning my phone off. And you and the kids are my top priority for the rest of the day. Yeah, I feel like you've given so many golden nuggets here. I, I love, well, first, I love the last thing you said about uh, essentially offering something in return. It's kind yeah. of what that is, right? Um, but also what you said about sharing with them what they're going to, what their support would do for you. And it makes me think of, uh, I mentioned Gottman. One of the, probably the single greatest thing I, that John Gottman said that I come back to again and again in my head is he said, if you want to have influence over the other person, allow them to have influence over you. Mm -hmm. And so I think what, what you described of going to them and saying, essentially you're saying, I want to have influence over you because I'm going to do this thing and I want you to be okay with it. But making sure they know that how much their response is going to have influence over you. Yeah is people have that like reciprocity instinct where if they know that they impact you, they're more open to being impacted by you. Mm. Is that, I mean, would you agree with that? Oh my gosh. Yeah, totally. Um, I mean like some of the most beautiful things that 
like recently, you know, he just said like, he's like, he was like, our relationship is a refuge, you know? And like, for me to go, oh, that's, that's what I'm creating is this like this regenerative space for him when he steps away from work uh, where he like gets to be like rejuvenated, Mm -hmm. right? Like now I have purpose in the partnership too. So um, absolutely. And it's like really like inviting them to like, what's their role in the co-creation of your success? I think uh, like that's, that's how you enroll them, you know? So and that's and that's you doing the the work to make it safer, to make it more exciting for them. Like if you're just coming to them and say like, "Hey, I'm going to do this super risky thing, and you're not going to see me as much, and I'm not going to be around for the kids," is like, of course she's going to be like, "Uh, no, right, like, I, right. we already don't see you enough." Versus like, "Hey, I know that like this is going to put some strain on us, and I would love to talk about like what do you need." in order to show up and give me support, right? Because this is what your support would provide for me. You yeah, know? And, and, and we're using this in the context of, I'm gonna take an entrepreneurial risk. But I mean, what you're saying is formulaic for a zillion different scenarios, right? Anytime I mean, you need support. Yeah, and, and support. really, I, and, and I wanna make sure I also go back to the first thing you said, which was, if you're, if you're gonna, as you put it, drop an uncertainty bomb in a moment, you can't demand a poised and confident response when you just introduce the opposite of that. You have to give them space to process and cope and deal and, and be clumsy. I like that you use that term. Um, and realize that clumsy, a lack of clumsiness is your responsibility too. Yeah. Right? There's an artfulness, which you've described, to how you deliver this. And to some degree, their response is going to be dictated by how artful you are in delivering the request in the first place. Yeah. And, yeah, and taking responsibility for that, right? And you can start to really like create practices. So um, I really like to think of relationship as like a yoga, right? So like a yoga practice is, let's say the metaphor, right? Like you come to your yoga mat, each day your body will feel different, but you show up, you're doing, you're doing the asanas, you're doing the positions or whatever, any kind of workout, right? It's like, there's like reps to it and you like learn more efficient ways to do it and better ways to do it and better form. Relationship is very much the same way. And so oftentimes too, like again, these uncertainty bombs is we'll just assume our partner's available for this conversation. Right. Just right. be like, hey babe, so I've been thinking, you know, and just like she's like in the middle of making breakfast, you know, right, right. or he just walked in the door from his job. And we're like, I want to do this crazy thing or this thing that feels crazy. Versus like, hey, I have something I want to talk to you about that's going to require both of our attention. You know, do you have 15, 30 minutes sometime today that we could like sit down and talk about it? Mm-hmm. You know, it's, it's about like, my, it's about my career. Right. Right. Give them a little tidbit so they're not like, oh, are we getting a divorce? Right. <laughs> you right. Know? Like give them like something to like, okay, okay, okay. Like this isn't an emergency. And then, they, and then, you know, he'll check and be like, oh, okay, yeah, like I could, I could do that at four o'clock today. Right. And then the, the, you've already set them up to bring more attention, more resiliency, um, more presence versus doing it when you're like commuting together. Oh God. Yeah. Right. Car, right. How many fights have you had driving in the car? Um, or people listening to this. Um, so is like really like budgeting those times and like, yeah, how do I actually set the other person up for success to be able mm-hmm. to receive this and show up and then also not put pressure on any one conversation. I think movies have really conditioned us to, ha- to have these like perfectly bookended conversations mm-hmm. where we say all the right things and we come to a resolution. And um, I'm a huge fan of like, let it be the first of several right? Where it might be like, hey, I want to run something by you. I actually don't want you to respond. I would love for you to sleep on it. And then like, can we check in and then check in about it again tomorrow where we both had some time to like think about it. And then I can answer any questions that have come up for you because I imagine this might like spark some doubt or some fear. And I really want to be, I really want to show up for you if that's what comes up for you. Right? So there's just a lot of, there's like very small things that you can do that can set you both up to have a more friction-free experience. I, I love that we've gotten into this because <laughs> I feel like you're, you're, you're coloring in between the lines of what you mean when you talk about engineering a successful relationship. I mean, these are the practical engineering mechanics that you're describing. And, and I know that there's a whole world of them. Mm-hmm. But this is like, this is so cool. And what's so cool about this, it's frankly, it's not like what I do. 
where like, I say, oh, well, you know, you got to set up a squeeze page and you have to, you know, write effective copy and you have to connect an autoresponder and you have to build your list and you want to segment your list. And there's a lot of like technical, what do those words mean kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. What you're saying is so like fluid and elegant because as it lands, you're like, well, duh, it's such common sense, but it's such uncommon sense. Yeah, because no one actually taught us and no one modeled this for us. Like we're highly, (laughs) highly normalized to dysfunctional relationships, which is why so many people stay in dysfunctional partnerships for so long is because most of our families of origin, there was a lot of pain and trauma that's like, you know, been passed down from generations, just people fucking making it up, being hurt and being like, I don't know, like, you know, don't do that smack or whatever. Um, that's I'm not making light, but like, you know, whatever, like physical, uh, reinforcement was like something that was used right, right. all the time for many, many generations. Like this is a very new generation that where that's not necessarily the case, you know? Um, yeah. So, and then the other thing is, um, is also recognizing like we are all making it up and we are most of us coming from dysfunctional environments Um, And so this idea too of like, I should be better at this is bananas, right? It's like, imagine we all got a kindergarten. My, I have a friend who he coaches uh, gay men in relationships and he, the most beautiful, he's like, we all have like a kindergarten level of education and we all want a master's level relationship. Hmm. That's not how that works. Right. right? Um, And so it really does benefit us to self-educate and like play and practice in this area because um, we weren't taught how to relate and relating is a skill. Like there's a reason that there are, that there's like rapport building workshops, at right, companies, right. you know, it's because like literally people have simply like learned how to relate through osmosis and it's not necessarily an intelligent or effective yeah. approach. There's two things you said that are so, I think, interesting to me that really, really resonated, which is first of all, staying in a dysfunctional relationship. I think most people are like, well, or many people are like, well, I don't, I don't want to leave. I'm scared of what that would look. And it's like, and I'm saying this from personal experiences, you know, my wife and I have been together for almost 10 years now and we were highly dysfunctional when we started. We both had past marriages. It didn't work. I mean, we, we both were kindergartners, like you say. And if, but we, we went and got a crap load of therapy and it got better. Like the, there's, there's a staying in a dysfunctional relationship. The opposite of that doesn't mean leaving necessarily it can also mean improving and there's process for that yeah and i think a lot of people i mean there's people still like i'm pretty i'm really open about therapy and all the work i've done and stuff but i still can tell there's some people that are super uncomfortable and dismissive that that's even like a thing or that it's not all just mumbo jumbo and people trying to take your money yeah you know you can fix these things and it's like to me it's like uh, the, the person who's a kindergartner and is like has literacy issues because they're a kindergartner and they haven't, they're not reading yet. The solution isn't to go learn a new language. Yeah. Oh, well, I, I suck at reading English. So I'll enroll in a Greek kindergarten. No, l- learn. Yeah. Right. <laughs> People uh, just don't even know, you know what I mean? Like, like we were even like at the very top of this call, we were talking about how like, Oh yeah, if you want better health, like, you go online and you research nutrition and you like try the keto protocol and you hire a personal trainer. If you want, you know, wealth, right. right? Like you talk to a financial advisor, you research, you read some books, think and grow rich. Right. And then with relationship, we actually really like drop out of creativity and innovation. Yeah. And, we, and we really resort to this unconscious conventional wisdom, which like one of my favorite things is like dating, dating myth busting, you know, um, because it's, like it's, we've just heard it so many times you repeat it, you know, like love finds you when you're not looking for it. Right. Like that there's no, it doesn't hold any water, but you've heard it so many times right, right. and it happened for you once when you were 17. So right. you're like, well, that must be true. Right. So there's just like a lack of intelligence and it really feels like it's kind of this final frontier of this like innovation sort of era that we're in where there's a lot of like uh, mindset innovation and technical in Right like actual innovation. Um, and it feels like this like love and relationship thing is this final frontier. So, where- so why do you, why is it the last domino to fall? And my theory is because it's kind of the, it's the least tangible. And it's also the thing where we have the fewest models of success because most 
success modeling of successful relationship technically happens behind closed doors. Like we don't really get to see it. Mm -hmm. You know, you see, you see a a really fit guy at the gym. You're like, Oh, he's fit. Fitness is a thing. Mm -hmm. You see a really wealthy guy with a big house. You go, Oh, he's got a big house. Wealth is a thing, but we never really see that with a relationship. We don't, we don't sit and listen to a conversation and go, Oh my gosh, that felt so cool because those conversations happen privately. Yeah. Is that, it? is that the reason you think? I think there's actually two. So one is um, this tangos with our, like the two primal human fears that are universal is that we're unworthy and therefore if we're unworthy, we're unlovable, right? So, so interacting in relationship brings you incredibly, incredibly close to our biggest fear, right? So one of the things that we spend the most time avoiding in our waking life um, so I think that, right, like I think it takes a, a lot of courage to, to be like, no, I am lovable, even though oftentimes like my nervous system doesn't believe it. So I'm going to show up for this, right? Um, and then the other thing too is I, I um, was recently reading a piece by, uh, last year I was reading a piece by this marriage historian. And it wasn't until even the 1970s that it became normalized socially for love to be a compelling reason to marry someone. Huh. Right. So if you think about it, love as a primary driver for choosing partnership has only been around for what, 50 years as far as like a commonplace practice. And that's just in, uh, I think she was just referring to like European North America. Right. right, right. Um, so it's probably, producers- it's probably, which we're, we're kind of at the, at the edge, the front edge, right. Other cultures, it's, it may still not even be a reason. There's still, yeah, there's still arranged marriage. And up until that point, it was absolutely for like resource acquisition political gain, uh, like social gain. Um, but it was very much, it was very much strategic. I mean, you even watch movies that take place in the fifties and people who married for love, I don't know if you ever saw revolutionary road, they were like, like crazy, you know? And Oh my God, you know, like she married a poet, (gasps) right? Like it was like, they were crazy and they'd be like social outcasts, you know? And it would have these like far reaching ramifications on their relationship because they chose each other for love in the fifties, you know? So I think, I think another reason why this, it's just super far behind because it's super far behind. Yeah. Right. So, so everything that's happening now is very much the leading edge of, um, like, like, a, I don't even think people knew that they could choose a powerful, like, partnership. So it's, it's almost like, like by even wanting relationship success, you're thrusting yourself to the edge of a progressive movement. Yeah. Which is so strange. I've never really heard it put in that way. Because to me, it's like, well, I was married before, and it was clumsy, and it, and it hurt. And it, and it, you know, in hindsight, it just kind of sucked. And it was miserable. And now, now, and now having done it again, it's like we went into it. I went into it. I can speak for myself. Like I'll do anything to make this joyful, Mm -hmm. you know? And and yet to realize that that's actually really, really progressive, I guess is the word. Like most people historically through human history, they never felt, they didn't feel like that was even a way that it was okay to feel or a thing that it was okay to ask for. Marriage wasn't something you did to be happy. Yeah, I guess it was something you did by, you know, procreatively and like you said, financially. Yeah. That's crazy. That is crazy. You know, Fiora, I, I had literally, this was not my agenda going into this. I would love to say that it was because it would make me feel and sound smarter. Um, but like these issues that I've talked about and said, how do you work with people? I'm literally just going to tell them to come watch this video. Cool. Yeah. So I, I feel like we've, we've helped a lot of people move, move forward in progressive ways. And honestly, you've helped me like, hmm. this has been really cool. Um, I, I want to make sure that people, cause I suspect there's uh, a, a number of people that are like probably riveted right now. Cause like we're getting into stuff that you just don't hear that much about. Um, and particularly, you know, entrepreneurial conversations don't often veer into this territory, but it's like, it's like you're saying it's the least charted, but most desired territory. Yeah. Right? Most desirable territory. Um, so how do people get more of it? How do people follow Fiora, maybe contact you for services, but how do they just enroll in your world? Yeah, I would say the two easiest, and I'll have you put it in the show notes just because my name sure. is kind of hard to spell, but like people can just message me on Facebook um, and uh, 
that's a great way to connect if they have follow up questions. Um, I, you know, I love connecting with people there. And I also like pr produce a lot of content as you shared, having right. stalked me already. Which right? is really good. I will, I will endorse that. So you don't have to talk so about how great you are. Her, her content is like flipping amazing. Like mm. we'll sign up Thank for you. it. If, if you're willing to go there, it's not, it's not light, soft, easy content. It's deep, profound, challenging content about relationships. But if you want the riches, you got to be willing to do the work. And I would say and her, her content challenges you to do that work. Cool. As second place, yeah. Instagram. So you can go to trulychosen.co. So that's my company is Truly Chosen. Because um, I think we all want a relationship that we truly choose and we want to feel truly chosen. So trulychosen.co. Yes, we'll make sure that we put that below, both of those in the show notes below. And I think that's what we got. I'm literally 30 minutes late for something and I knew it the whole time and I messaged him. I said, I got to see this through. It's a great oh, conversation. thank you, Jeff. Yeah, no, this is wonderful. Um, I really appreciate your time. I, I know that there's been so much value transferred here to our audience. Um, I just, I, I have, I always have to say, listen, guys, if you want more of this, I mean, I hope that I've demonstrated through this and other conversations that like, I'm not just here to talk about how to make money. I, I understand that people very often want to thrust that to, that to the forefront of their life as like their, you know, Maslow's hierarchy forces me to make this my primary concern, but there's so much more to a rich and wonderful life. And I'm super grateful that we got into that. If you want more of that, whether it's sales, marketing, investing, finance, business, entrepreneurialism, relationships, communication, fitness, health, wellness, the whole gamut, subscribe to my channel, please. Make sure you click the little bell to get notified as I put out new videos. And um, with that, Fiora, I just want to say thanks again. This has been really wonderful. My pleasure. Thanks for having me. Okay. We'll catch everyone next time. And uh, Fiora, I'll make sure we get your stuff down below. Take care. Take care.